message this morning is entitled Daniel 9, 24 to 27, which is the famous and very well-known passage of the 70 weeks of Daniel. And first of all, I would like to share a quote by John Calvin, who in his commentary on Daniel wrote the following. This passage has been variously treated and almost torn to pieces by the various opinions of interpreters that it might be considered nearly useless on account of its obscurity. But in the assurance that no prediction is really in vain, we may hope to understand this prophecy, provided only we are attentive and teachable according to the angel's admonition and the prophet's example. And before we get into the actual text, I want to share another quote, which is by Rupertus Meldenius, which is, ex and this, the spirit of this quote should characterize all Christian discussion of theology, Christian questions, Christian interpretation of the word, and it's in the essentials unity, in non-essentials liberty, in all things charity. And I, wanted, and I wanted to emphasize this at the beginning of this message, especially with this conference, because eschatology can be an extremely divisive manner, uh, extremely divisive matter. And I would set forth, I think, the, f the five principal essentials of a Christian eschatology that all Christians should be able to agree on are the future bodily return of the Lord Jesus Christ in glory, the general resurrection of the righteous and the wicked, the final judgment, and then an eternal state for the righteous in the new heavens and the new earth, and an eternal state for the wicked, the reprobate, and the lake of fire. Those five things all Christians should be able to agree upon. So when it comes to questions of the millennium, when it comes to questions of the timing of the rapture, when it comes to questions of uh, a restoration of Israel, those are important matters in and of themselves, but they're not the absolute essentials that make and define a Christian eschatology as orthodox. So let's keep that in mind. So when we're dealing with questions on the millennium, interpretations of revelation, these are areas of, that are disputable matters of the Christian faith when it comes to eschatology. So, and especially in all things charity, when we go through these discussions, you know, let us keep in mind that, that humility and that love that the Lord Jesus Christ exemplified in his own teaching and his own life. Now, when we approach Daniel 9, 24 to 27, I want to set forth the idea, and this is my opinion, there's three primary questions that must be answered with regards to this particular text. And they surpass all others in importance with regards to the interpretation of this prophecy. The first is, who is the figure described as Messiah the Prince in Daniel 9, 25? The second is, what is the covenant with the many in Daniel 9.27? And then the third is, who is the prince that shall come in Daniel 9.26? So there are other important questions when it comes to this prophecy. Do we take the weeks as literal weeks of years? Do we take them in a figurative sense? And those are important questions, but these are the most three, that these are the three most important questions when you're coming to an interpretation, an understanding of this prophecy. And at the outset, I also want to emphasize a Christotelic hermeneutic. So we've spoken a, of this principle at previous conferences. So this is, whether you use the term Christological, Christocentric, Christotelic, so these are all facets of the same hermeneutical principle that emphasizes, it, it comes from the combination of two Greek words, Christos, of course, meaning Christ, and telos, meaning the end or goal in Greek. So when this, these are put together, a Christotelic hermeneutic views the Lord Jesus Christ as the ultimate goal or end of God's word and seeks to consistently interpret all scripture in view of this great truth. So that's all, that's all I'm saying when someone says a Christocentric or Christotelic or Christological, these are all different facets of this same interpretive technique. And this hermeneutic emphasizes five principles, and I'll lay them out briefly here. The first is that the Lord Jesus Christ is the nexus of God's plan and redemptive history. He is the center. He is the central figure, the central actor 
in God's redemptive plan. He is a central focus. And all scripture refers to either Christ directly, you have messianic prophecies that directly address him, it refers to Christ typologically, you see that in the feasts of Israel, you see that in the sacrificial system, or it prepares the way for Christ by the unfolding of redemptive history, which un ultimately points to his person and work. So the ratification, the institution of the Abrahamic covenant, and there's typological elements, so these are not discrete categories that don't overflow and intermix with one another. The third, which has already, which Dr. Long mentioned yesterday, and was referred to this morning, is the New Testament scriptures must have interpretive priority over the Old Testament. And this is not to demean the Old Testament, it's not to take away that it's inspired, it's no less inspired, it's no less um, completely God's word than the New Testament is. All this is saying is that whenever, whatever subject that the New Testament speaks on, it has the final say due to it being the final inscripturated revelation of God. That's all that is saying. And then four, an accurate analysis, <clears throat> excuse me, of a passage's context is key, so the local context, literary, canonical, and historical context, and then historical grammatical interpretation guided by principles one through four. Now, a Christotelic view of Daniel 9, 24 to 27, I, I, I would submit to you that it's going to foretell the following events. The coming and crucifixion of the Messiah, the establishment of the new covenant, the destruction of Jerusalem, and the ultimate jubilee. And I'll get into especially the fourth as we proceed on. Now let's set the context of Daniel 9, 24 to 27 so we're not interpreting it out of, out of the book itself and out of the literary context that it occurs. So in the book of Daniel, in the first six chapters, you have court narrative where Daniel is carried off to Babylon and then later on continues in the courts, in the Persian courts as well with Darius and with Cyrus and so forth. Chapters 7 through 12 are primarily apocalyptic prophecy. There's a high degree of symbolism. It's referring to uh, events in the future, some that are closer to Daniel, some that are more further out related to the very end of time. Now the structure, I want to also emphasize, there's a chiastic structure of Daniel 8, 1 to 12, 4. And I'll, I'll lay that out in, in the next series of slides. And, but this is very important to understanding the unique placement of Daniel 9, 24 to 27 inside the book itself and inside this particular section. Now, before we get into that, I'm going to define what a chiasm is. And here's a definition by Brad McCoy. A chiasm is the use of inverted parallelism of form and or content, which moves toward and away from a strategic central component. So these can be thematic chiasms, they can be word structures, and so forth. But at the very, at the central point, that's the point of emphasis that the authors are making. Now, we don't, we don't use this in English uh, more so in the Western, but this is very common in the Near East and even in Greco-Roman writing as well, the use of chiasms. Now, this particular chiasm in Daniel 8, 1 to 12, 4 is a thematic chiasm. And I would argue that it confirms the validity of and necessity for a Christotelic hermeneutic, that we interpret this prophecy with Christ as its ultimate end or goal. And various other groups, this is not something that's unique uh, to this particular viewpoint, which would, I, is a New Covenant theological viewpoint. The dispensational viewpoint also argues that Messiah, the Prince, is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. So there is also Christ, there are Christological elements and other theological interpretations of this prophecy. Now here is the thematic chiasm of Daniel 8, 1 to 12, 4, and I want you to see the parallelism as it moves inward towards the, this prophecy itself. So you have A, the A is right here, the first, the vision of future Gentile kingdoms, kings and kingdoms, and then you have its parallel in 11.2 to 12.4, a vision of future Gentile kings and kingdoms. Then you have this reference to Darius the Mede, both in 9.1 to 2 and 11.1. 1. 
Then you have in Daniel 9, 3 to 19, which is the immediate context surrounding the prophecy itself, Daniel issues this distressed prayer, crying out to God to renew the covenant, to restore Israel, to restore Jerusalem. And then that's paralleled by Daniel's terror being comforted when he's visited by an angelic messenger in chapter 10, 12 to 21. Then you have an angelic messenger who commends Daniel and refers to him as Daniel as being beloved in 9, 20 to 23. And then there's another angelic messenger that repeats this in 10, 1 to 11. And then at the very center point of this thematic chiasm, you have the 77s and the Messiah. So this is the, enti- this is the central point of the entire, more or less, second half of the book of Daniel, which deals everything from prophecies pertaining to Rome, uh, to Antiochus Epiphanes, to what followed Alexander the Great's death, and so forth. But the main center point of all of this that Daniel wants to bring your focus on, and the reader's focus on, is, Dan- is the 77s and the Messiah. So now the context, the immediate context of Daniel 9, 24 to 27. So the historical context, Jerusalem, Jerusalem's desolation of 70 years. So recall that Nebuchadnezzar has carried off the Jews into Babylon. So the Jewish people are currently exiled in, in Babylon and they're undergoing this desolation, which was predicted. So in Daniel chapter 9, verses 1 to 2, in the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of Median descent, who was made king over the kingdom of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, observed in the books the numbers of the years which was revealed as the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet for the completion of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. So Daniel is studying the words of the prophets, and likely what's his, the, the reference here is, to, is Jeremiah 25, 1 to 13, and 29, 1 to 23. I'm not going to read those specifically just in the interest of time, uh, so, I can, so we can get through this entire uh, message. But Daniel is studying the word of God, he's studying the prophets, he's studying what God has revealed to the prophet Jeremiah that the, des- the desolation of Jerusalem would be 70 years. And it's approaching that time, is approaching that time that that desolation is about to end. And so in that particular, and there's a question, are the 70 years literal or symbolic? And that, that's, that, that's a question that uh, we can discuss later. Um, there are some that argue for a literal, based on the, the, the certain number of exiles that occurred with when Nebuchadnezzar ascended to the throne of Babylon, so beginning in 605, or if they're counting from when Jerusalem's final destruction in 587 and so forth, to when they were released under Cyrus the Great in 538. Or are they symbolic? And you do have various examples in the kings of Babylon and the kings of Assyria where they're using 70 in a symbolic form as a symbol of judgment, as this round number, this symbolic number uh, for divine judgment. So cases have been made on both sides uh, for the argument that whether they're literal or symbolic. Now the local context of the prophecy itself is Daniel's prayer. So Daniel's prayer is essentially the prophet's cry to Yahweh to renew his covenant with Israel. So referring to the Mosaic covenant and to end the nation's exile. And there is a covenantal structure to this prayer that's very important to understanding not only the prayer itself, but what follows in Gabriel's, in the Lord's answer through Gabriel to Daniel. So you have Daniel in verse 4 invoking the sovereign Lord of the covenant. You have Daniel's confession of Israel's covenantal transgression. So he goes forth and lays out the, that the rulers have rebelled, that the nation has sinned. And then he recounts the punitive curses of the covenant. He goes through them that the Lord promised that this would occur if the nation turns away, if its kings do not listen, if the people do not listen, this is what would happen to them, and that the Lord promised this. 
And then Daniel recounts Yahweh's righteous covenantal acts in the past of what he has done on behalf of Israel. And then he appeals to Yahweh for compassion and appeals to Yahweh to renew the covenant, to restore it, to allow the Jews to return home, to rebuild the temple, to rebuild Jerusalem and restore their place. Now, Daniel's prayer is the only place in the entire book of Daniel where Yahweh, the covenantal name of God, appears. And it occurs here eight times. It's the only other place. So this, this covenant, that this prayer is very covenantal. It's appealing to covenantal language. It's using the Lord's covenantal name as Daniel appeals to the Lord. And aside from Daniel 1-2, this chapter is the only place where Adonai, which is, means the Lord par excellence in Hebrew, is used with reference to God. And Daniel also addresses God ten times with this term in this prayer. So, high concentration of covenantal language here. And here's a quote from Meredith Klein that pertains to this. So, other words found here in their specialized treaty or covenant meanings are ahav, which means love, chesed, covenant loyalty, and suv, to turn, and chata, sin. And the prayer is indeed saturated with formulaic expressions drawn from the Mosaic treaties or the covenants, particularly from the Deuteronomic treaty. So there's a high saturation here. And if we, and if we miss this point that Daniel's prayer is, is, a, is a cry to the Lord to renew his covenant with Israel, we're going to miss how we interpret Gabriel's answer that he delivers to Daniel. So Daniel's prayer is of the Todah genre, a type of Hebrew prayer characterized by a confession of sin, the recounting of God's righteous acts, and appeal for covenant renewal. So you find this throughout, you find this in the Psalms, you find this in the prophets as well. And there's also a parallel structure here which we'll get into uh, a few slides later, so of Daniel 9, 26 to 27, which also follows a covenantal format, de detailing on one hand the ultimate blessings and fulfillment of the Mosaic Covenant, which ultimately comes in the new, in Christ, along with the covenantal curses that are going to be laid out, and you see that in the destruction of Jerusalem that's prophesied in the prophecy itself. So as indicated by Daniel 9, 3 to 19 in Daniel's prayer, this highly covenantal language, this appeal to Yahweh to renew the covenant. Gabriel's answer, so the Lord's answer that Gabriel delivers to Daniel must concern Yahweh's renewal and ultimate fulfillment of the Mosaic covenant. It's not, it can't be related to some covenant, in my opinion, far off into the future. That, uh, that certain groups, some hold that it was some hold that it's a treaty between uh, unbelieving Israel and the Antichrist. That, that seems to be out of place with what the context of Daniel's prayer is referring to. So, and as I just mentioned, uh, a prominent dispensational view of the covenant with the many, that it is this covenant between the Antichrist and unbelieving Israel, which takes place in a final literal 70th week of Daniel. And in my opinion, and I, in, and, I'm don't, and I don't intend to throw stones by saying this, that just feels out of place with the context of Daniel's prayer. Now, Gabriel, of course, is the angelic herald of the Messiah. Now, we see that, uh, we see that in Daniel 8, where Gabriel delivers a prophecy in which Christ is referred to as the Prince of Princes, the Sar Sarim, in verse 25 of Daniel 8. He's also in Luke 1, 11 to 20, so in the gospel account. So Gabriel announces the birth of not only John the Baptist, the forerunner and earthly herald of Christ, he also announces Christ's birth to Mary. So Gabriel's presence here also likely indicates that Messiah the Prince in Daniel 9, 25 must be Christ Jesus. So not Cyrus of Persia, who's also referred to as a Messiah, not to an anointed high priest. Uh, Onias III has been set forth during the Maccabean-Hasmonean time period, and not a governor of Judah. 
So the fact that Gabriel is here based off of what we see him doing elsewhere in the New Testament and elsewhere in the book of Daniel would seem to indicate and furnish further evidence that this is a prophecy relating to the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah. So coming to Daniel 9, 24 to 27. So 70 weeks have been decreed for your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. And I'll point out that place is in italics because literally it's the most holy. So you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. It will be built again with plaza and moat, even in times of distress. Then after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and sanctuary. And its end will come with a flood. Even to the end there will be war. Desolations are determined. And he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week. But in the middle of the week he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. And on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate. Even until a complete destruction, one that is decreed is poured out on the one who makes desolate. So the 77, so the Hebrew word for weeks, Shavuim, is derived from Shavua, meaning a heptad, so it's a grouping of seven. And very often this is interpreted of a chronological time period, so a week of days, a week of years, and so forth. And the number seven in Near Eastern literature often possesses a symbolic meaning. So not only in the biblical text itself, but in other ancient Near Eastern literature. You see that in the Black Stone of Esarhaddon, which I referred to earlier. You see that uh, in the Book of Enoch. You see it in a whole variety of other things, not only in Babylonian, Assyrian, Jewish literature, and so forth of the time period. Now, Bruce Waltke states, in the Bible, the number seven is connected with every aspect of religious life. In relation to time, Seven represents a fitting or sacred period. More generally, it indicates a complete or round number of moderate size. So in other words, it's more of a symbolic. It has, a, a, it has religious overtones. It's a, it's a number of completeness. It's not necessarily, so when it appears, even in some of the, the, the extra biblical examples that I mentioned, the, such as the Black Stone of Esarhaddon, it's not referring to a literal time period, but it has this religious overtone of being a, a complete or round number that's associated with that, that particular um, judgment or, or time period or so forth. So the 77s, so I would set forth, and I lean towards this in, in my own uh, understanding of the prophecy. So the 77s is 490 symbolic years, which constitute 10 Jubilee cycles. So 10 is another symbolic round number. So we heard uh, in, the, in the discussion, in the teaching about the millennium, so 10 times 10 times 10 being a symbolic number. So seven is very much like that, and then you have seven times seven times 10 here. So this, this seems to set forth, and the fact that Daniel is apocalyptic literature, it's speaking of the, the end times, it's speaking of a narrow time frame, there's symbolic language and so forth. And there's, there's, it's usually mediated through an, an angel or an angelic messenger. And after these 10 jubilee cycles comes the ultimate jubilee or the eternal state. And this has already been inaugurated with the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And here's a short diagram of what a jubilee cycle would be. So you have seven sabbatical cycles, so seven groupings of seven years apiece, so 49, and then after which comes the Jubilee. And there's been already been discussion and reference here to the typology when it, as relates to prophecy. So the Jubilee was typological of the final end time Jubilee. So the traditional Jubilee year, the land experienced a year-long Sabbath rest, so no planting, 
and so forth, no, no, no farming or so forth, to let the land rest. The land reverted back to its original owners, so particular territories within uh, ancient Israel and, and Judah would, would stay within certain families, would stay within the tribes. And all debts were canceled, and all slaves and indentured servants were freed. Now, these speak ultimately of the ultimate jubilee which occurs with the Lord Jesus Christ. So believers experience the inaugurated fulfillment of true rest in Christ Jesus. Hebrews 4, 9, the new heavens and the new earth will be given, which the land, which the promised land ultimately symbolizes in the eternal state. Will be, the new heavens and the new earth will be given to believers. You see that in Romans 8, 19 to 23, 2 Peter 3, 10 to 13. And the debt of sin will be completely dealt with by the Lord Jesus Christ's person and work and his sacrifice on the cross and resurrection. And believers will be completely freed from the slavery of sin. You hear this language is replete in the New Testament. You are no longer a slave to sin, so don't offer your, your members up to sin. So you are under grace. And we see, especially in Luke, Christ's earthly ministry inaugurated the ultimate jubilee. And this will be consummated at his glorious return. So this is another, I would argue that this is another instance of the now, not yet. Christ has already inaugurated all of this. So you see in his own ministry, uh, as the true Israel, you see in his baptism, overtones going all the way back to the creation itself. So with the Holy Spirit descending upon him like a dove, you hear echoes of the Spirit brooding over the waters in the Genesis account, symbolizing that the, that the ministry, that with the coming of Christ, a new creation has broken into the old creation, and God is, t- is actively taking back and bringing everything under Christ's authority and, and subduing his enemies under his feet. So the new creation is already broken forth now in the Lord Jesus Christ. And at the beginning of his ministry, Jesus reads the Jubilee passage of Isaiah 61, 1-2 while he's in the Nazarene synagogue. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. And the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. And he opened the book and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are downtrodden, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down, and the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed upon him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. This is a very well-known jubilee passage referring to the release of the captives. And, and so forth. So the fact that Christ starts off his ministry with this passage, the jubilee has already broken forth. The new creation is here. It's already been inaugurated, and it's going to be consummated when the Lord Jesus returns in glory. And this, the, the sevens have six purposes that Daniel states in verse 24. So 70 weeks have been decreed for your people in your holy city. So one, to finish the transgression. Two, to make an end of sin. Three, to make atonement for iniquity. Four, to bring in everlasting righteousness. Five, to seal up vision and prophecy. And six, to anoint the most holy. So you have the first three goals that are focusing on the the removal of sin. And you have the second three that focus on the restoration of righteousness. And both of these, all six of these goals are being fulfilled and have been fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. So, and there's, there's an aspect where these have already been inaugurated, but they're still being enacted through the Lord Jesus Christ. So you have the already, they've been inaugurated, Christ's sacrifice on the cross, and then now it's being applied to his people and the restoration of righteousness and subduing all his enemies underneath him. So there, there are three segments. When you, when you approach the, the 70 weeks prophecy, there are three segments of the sevens. So you have the initial seven, and then the prophecy mentions 62 sevens, and then you have the last seven. 
I would set forth this, the first seven sevens symbolize the complete period from Cyrus the Great to the complete restoration of the city of Jerusalem in that time. And there's no temporal break in between that first segment of the sevens, and there's no, there's no break between that and the 62. And the 62 sevens symbolize the complete period from Jerusalem's restoration to Christ's first coming. And then the 70th seven includes Christ's earthly ministry in the first half. And then I would argue, from a symbolic perspective, that it's the entire new covenant age because you have this recapitulation. The church recapitulates in itself even the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ was baptized with the Holy Spirit in the Jordan River. The church was baptized with the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. Christ suffered. The, his people are going to suffer. There's this recapitulation with the church. It's this re repeating, this, this thematic repetition. So the breaks between these sevens are likely non-temporal. So especially, definitely between the first two segments and where dispensationalism would differ is they put a, a multi-millennial gap between the 62 and that last seven. Now, in my opinion, that would go against the precedent that you've already established in the prophecy because there's no gap between the seven and the 62. So why are we going to put a gap in between the 62 and the last week? And I would argue that Cyrus's decree is the trigger of the sevens. Now, classical dispensationalism generally differs with this particular view, and they rather take Artaxerxes the first due to the fact that they interpret the sevens as a literal 490 years, so they trigger it at 445 slash 444 BC when Artaxerxes I sent Nehemiah to rebuild Jerusalem's walls. And they base this on 2 Chronicles 36, 22 to 23, Ezra 1, 1 to 4, and Ezra 6, 3 to 5. And, and, to, and to be fair, these, these, certain, these uh, passages do reproduce portions of Cyrus's decree, um, and they don't make mention of the, they only make mention of the temple, not the city of Jerusalem itself. So that's where this argument is primarily based on. And, and in response, I would say, these are only reproducing portions of Cyrus's decree because we do have Josephus' account of this decree where everything is laid out to rebuild the city, to build the temple of God at Jerusalem. Now granted, of course, Josephus is not inspired and I would agree with Calvin's assessment. I candidly confess that I cannot place confidence in Josephus either at all times or without exception. So, so that, that being recognized, Josephus is not scripture. But this does offer another view that maybe perhaps the biblical writers didn't reproduce all of the decree because after all, the temple was the most important place in the city of Jerusalem. And I would, I would set forth, Yahweh declares in Isaiah 44, 24 and four, uh, to 45, 13 that he appointed Cyrus of Persia to issue the decree for the rebuilding of his uh, temple and the city of Jerusalem. So in 44.28, the Lord declares, It is I who says of Cyrus, He is my shepherd, and he will perform all my desire. And he declares of Jerusalem, She will be built, and of the temple your foundation will be laid. And in 45.13 of Isaiah, Yahweh again proclaims, I have aroused him Cyrus in righteousness, and I will make all his ways smooth. He, that is Cyrus, will build my city and let my exiles go free without any payment or reward. So in these verses do support the view that Cyrus's decree is the actual trigger of the sevens, in my opinion. Now, to be fair, some scholars do point to Ezra 6.14 as indicating that Artaxerxes' decree is still valid because it's a renewal of Cyrus's original decree. So, for example, uh, in the last section of this verse, and they finished building according to the command of the God of Israel and the decree, and notice, decree singular of Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes. So this particular view, to be fair, and it, and it, has, it definitely has merit, so Artaxerxes was, was renewing uh, the decree that Darius, Darius himself had renewed, which was Cyrus's decree to rebuild the city and the temple. So in other words, it is possible to uphold Cyrus as the original issuer of the decree 
yet count literal weeks of years from Artaxerxes the fourth renewal of the decree. And like I said before, this is a matter that we can, we can freely differ on. So, and again, this doesn't even approach those three central questions of the prophecy that I set forth. So now coming to Messiah the Prince, Mashiach Nagid. So Messiah or anointed one is derived from the Hebrew word Mashach, meaning to spread a liquid or to anoint. So literally meaning an anointed one. In the Old Testament, Messiah is used of the patriarchs, the high priest, the king of Israel, even Cyrus the Great, a Gentile ruler, and the eschatological Messiah. Now, the second Hebrew word in the phrase is nagid, and it can be translated as chief, leader, sovereign, or prince. And although Mashiach and Nagid only occur together in noun form in this particular passage in Daniel 9.25, Nagid occurs with the Hebrew verb to anoint, Mashiach, in the following texts. So 1 Samuel 9.16 and 10.1, 2 Samuel 5.2-3, 1 Kings 1.34-35, 1, and 1 Chronicles 11 and 1 Chronicles 29. And each of these verses is a reference to the king of Israel. Each of these verses. So when, these, when, these various, when the various forms of these two words occur together, it's always a reference to the king of Israel. So this is, yet again, further evidence. Messiah the prince must refer to the Lord Jesus Christ. So not a high priest so as Onias III or to a Gentile ruler or to a, or to a governor of Judea during the Hasmonean or Maccabean, Maccabean periods. And here's a quote from Dr. Peter Gentry of Southern Seminary. There is good reason why the future king is referred to in verses 25 and 26 by the term Nagid, ruler, excuse me, rather than by the term Melech, the standard word in Hebrew for king. In short, Nagid communicates kingship according to God's plan and standards, whereas Melech communicates kingship according to the Canaanite model of absolute despotism and self-aggrandizement. And that is why the term Nagid dominates in the passage on the Davidic covenant, and is also the term used here. So you hear an echo here by the usage of Nagid, even all the way back to the Davidic covenant. And so the coming, the coming ruler from the line of David. Now in Daniel 9.26, you have a series of parallel verses. And this, this particular view that I'm setting forth, I believe hinges on the recognition of this parallelism between 26 and 27. And the, the specific term is a parallelism of specification, so the succeeding lines give the specifics of their predecessors. They're fleshing them out, they're giving them, giving more details. And so the two verses can be broken down into two halves and I'll display them up there, so half A and half B. And when they're placed side by side, it's clear that each half of verse 27 specifies additional information about its corresponding half in verse 26. So 26a, then after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. Corresponds with the first half of 27, and he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week, but in the middle of the week, he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. And then back up to 26, and the people of the prince, Nagid, who is to come, will destroy the city and the sanctuary, and its end will come with a flood. Even to the end, there will be war. Desolations are determined has a parallel with on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate even until a complete destruction, one that is decreed is poured out on the one who makes desolate. So in this you have, you have the fulfillment again of the ultimate blessings, the ultimate fulfillment of the Mosaic covenant. So the Messiah is cut off and has nothing and he, and he makes a firm covenant with the many one week and, and we'll go into more detail of that. And then you have in 26b and 27b the out. The, the laying out of the covenantal curses, which culminates in the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. So the covenant with the many, I would submit, is the new covenant. So then, you, then after the 62 weeks, the Messiah, Mashiach, will be cut off, karat. And this is a word that occurs very often in the making or the cutting literal of a covenant. And as we said before, corresponding with the first half of 27, and he will make a firm 
covenant berit with the many for one week. So karat and berit, you have this, you have this juxtaposition of even more covenantal language than we've, as we've already mentioned and seen in uh, the earlier parts of chapter nine. So karat berit is to literally cut a new covenant or to cut a covenant and typically refers to a new covenant or, or a fresh covenant. Now, there's also no durative preposition for in Daniel 9.27. It's usually supplied. So some of you have argued for, and he will make a firm covenant with the many during the one week. So there's no, there's no preposition there. It's usually uh, supplied by the interpreters or the translators. And you have the indefiniteness of berit. So there's no, it's not ha berit. So we'll cut the covenant. And this indefiniteness may likely be a reference or an echo of Jeremiah 31, 31 to 33, where it's discussing a new covenant, a covenant. And he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week. So now we turn to the recipients of the covenant. So in the many, Larabim refers to believers. And the reason why I submit that is in Daniel 11, 33 and 12, 2 to 3, and in verse 10 of chapter 12, the many refers to righteous saints. So it's not referring to unbelieving Israel. It's not referring to uh, Israelites or who are a rejection of the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. And in Isaiah, which the book of Daniel repeatedly makes reference to, in Isaiah 53, verse 11, by his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many. It's the same exact word in Hebrew, Larabim. Now, Matthew 26, 28, this is the institution of the Lord's Supper. And Christ says, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. So Christ is making reference back to this prophecy and making reference to Isaiah 53. And then in Luke's version, in the Lucan account of the institution of the Lord's Supper, this cup, which is poured out for you, so now Luke is identifying even with more detail who the many is. It's you, it's believers. It's poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. And Higbir, which literally here, he will strengthen or make firm a covenant. So Higbir comes from the Hebrew word gabar. It le- uh, means to be or to make strong. And this verb can be interpreted in one of two ways here. So it's, it can be viewed as a synonym of karat bari, to initiate a covenant or a new covenant. And it can also mean the strengthening or the confirming of God's promises of a new covenant. So, and, the, and I, I tend to, these are not mutually exclusive, and I tend to view them both as, as possible interpretations and likely interpretations of how this verb is being used. So, especially with verse 2, the fact that Higbir is using, God is confirming, he's making strong, he's confirming these promises that he's already set forth to bring this new covenant that he revealed in Jeremiah and in Ezekiel. And this new covenant is in the fulfillment of the old covenant. And even Isaiah, Isaiah refers to Yahweh as El Gibor. This is coming from the same, the same word family here. So Gibor, mighty God, or the God of strength. In Isaiah 9, 5, 10 to 21. And this may, Daniel 9, 26, may perhaps refer to these passages in Isaiah, because there, there may be echoes here. So in other words, Yahweh, the mighty God, is the one who in Jesus Christ strengthens the covenant with the many, brings it to pass, brings to pass his promises of the new covenant. So he causes the sacrifice to cease. So 27a, in the middle of the week, he will put a a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. By his once for all time sacrifice, Christ caused the sacrifices to cease. They lost all value for redemptive purposes after the cross. So for all practical purposes, the end of the Old Covenant is the cross. And then 70 AD is the finalization that the Old Covenant is gone and passed away. In Hebrews 10, 14, for by one offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. Hebrews 8, 13, when he said a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. 
But whatever is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to disappear. So Christ is the one who in the middle of the week puts a stop to the sacrifice and grain offering. And the cessation of this sacrificial system, again, like I mentioned earlier, was fully realized in 70 AD with the destruction of the temple and Jerusalem. And so now we turn to the destruction of Jerusalem itself. So 20, the second half of 26. And the people of the prince, Nagid. So pay attention, Nagid is being repeated here. So it's been used once before, Mashiach Nagid, Messiah the prince. And the Messiah is cut off. Messiah is used by itself. And the noun Nagid is being used by itself. So the, the, uh, the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary and its end will come with a flood. Even to the end there will be war. Desolations are determined. And then it's, it's parallel. And on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate even until a complete destruction, one that is decreed, is poured out on the one who makes desolate. So the, the second halves here, given the, the very strong covenantal nature of Daniel's prayer, the answer is also covenantal. It's, it's foretelling, the Lord is answering, this is how I'm going to fulfill the covenant ultimately. These are the blessings that I have promised that I'm going to bring to fruition. But as well, the curses will also be enacted for those who reject me and reject the Messiah. Now, I would set forth the coming prince here is the Messiah himself. And notice, notice who are the people who are destroying or spoiling the city and the sanctuary. It's the people of the prince. It's not the prince himself. And, 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 various, and other interpretations of this prophecy view the people as the Romans here with Titus being the prince. And the reason why I would set forth that the coming prince is, is Messiah the prince is previous reference, just grammatically speaking, so you have, again, Messiah the Prince earlier refers to the Lord Jesus Christ. Messiah in Daniel 9.26, where the Messiah is cut off, no one disputes that that refers back to Messiah the Prince as well. But then when Nagid occurs by itself, some interpret that as referring to the Antichrist. Um, so the people of the Prince, the Romans, who are in some interpretations identified with the Antichrist here. So the, uh, the prince who is to come is, refer, is interpreted by some to be the Antichrist. I would say just, just the grammatics of this prophecy, the grammatical rule of previous reference would, would seem to lend more support to the prince here being Messiah the prince. And again, that quotation by Dr. Peter Gentry. Melech is the one, is the word for ruler that's used for a despot. So it's used for uh, one who self-aggrandizes himself, whereas prince is connected to the Davidic covenant. It's connected to uh, the Davidic line and the promises. And the people of the prince who is to come will destroy and spoil the city and the sanctuary. So again, the use of Nagid versus Melech, I would, again, I would say lends more credence that Nagid here is referring to the Messiah. Now that would say the, the people of the, the prince who is to come with this particular viewpoint would indicate that this is involved that the Jewish people in rebellion when they rebelled against not only the Messiah, rejected the Messiah and then rebelled against Rome. They're the ones who destroyed or spoiled the city and the temple. And Josephus even appears to support this view. So the zealots defiled the temple by entering they murdered opponents within the temple courts. They even set up their, their headquarters, more or less, with John of Giscala within the temple precincts. And the Jews initiated the final skirmish, at least according to Josephus' testimony, which led to the burning down of the temple. Now, now whether Josephus is just uh, appealing to uh, Titus for whatever reason, whether... Um, so, because he alleges in his account that Titus wanted to keep the temple because it was a mar marvelous edifice. So whether, whether that's accurate or not, um, the, the Lord knows. But Josephus at least argues and sets forth, and if we take him on, on that, uh, depending on whether he's accurate or not, he at least writes that the Jews initiated the final skirmish, 
And what happened was a torch was, ended up being thrown into the temple building itself, which started a fire that triggered the burning down of the temple. So, again, Titus, according to Josephus, whether he's accurate or just trying to save his own skin with, his, uh, with who he was in, um, in the service of at the particular time, he argues that he wanted to preserve the temple. So now Jesus and the apostles foretold that Jer uh, Jerusalem's destruction resulted from Israel's mass rejection of the Messiah. So and the Jews were ultimately culpable for the events of 70 AD. So a, a variety of passages. So Matthew 21, 43, Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and will be given to a nation producing the fruit of it. And there's another similar passage in Matthew 23. Again, in Acts 3, 22 to 23, Moses said, I will raise up a, uh, for you a prophet like me from your brethren. And then skipping down to verse 23, and it shall be that every soul that does not heed that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among you. So the prophet, so the apostles, and the, the New Testament would seem to indicate that 70 AD was a manifestation fulfilling this promise of judgment for those who would reject the Messiah. I believe I am out of time. So we'll wrap it up there. Um, but going back to the three principal questions. So the three principal questions. Who is Messiah the Prince? Again, this, this particular view that I've set forth, it, it's the Lord Jesus Christ. What is the covenant with the many? It is the new covenant. And I think that it can be argued from not only other scriptural references, from the context itself, from the Daniel's prayer for covenant renewal, and then who is the prince to come? I would again, grammatical previous reference, Nagid is being used there, um, and since Mashiach Nagid refers to Christ, Mashiach refers to Christ, Nagid would seem most likely to refer to Christ himself as well. And this would appear at least on some level to be confirmed by Josephus' account. And granted, Josephus is not... Um, it's not scripture, but it does function as a historical witness. So those are the three questions. Now, whether the weeks are viewed as literal or symbolic, there's room for disagreement and so forth. But those are the three principal questions um, that surround this prophecy and the three most important to answer. So the others, the other questions, um, good people disagree. I know folks who hold the same answers to those three questions that differ on the other minor matters of, of the prophecy with me. And that's, that's more, that's totally fine. We're, we're all brothers in Christ. This is an in-house discussion. And, and even matters differing between New Covenant theology and prophecy and dispensationalism and covenant theology, again, this is an in-house discussion. So in the essentials, unity, and the non-essentials, liberty, and all things, charity. So, so we shall finish there. <laughs>